Thanks, Ben. It's great to see you here all tonight, and I'm excited to go with you through the Sacrament of Confirmation. I do remember that night that I met Ben for the first time. It was, it was as if it was missionary against missionary, because Ben was a missionary with focus at the time at the University of Denver. And I, I won't forget that night when he talked about a word that I had never heard before, typology. And he started talking about Joseph in the Old Testament, the patriarch Joseph, and then he started comparing him to St. Joseph in the New, New Testament. And I was blown away, because I thought I was a very schooled person in Scripture, and here it was, this, this Catholic guy teaching me about Scripture. I couldn't believe it. It blew my stereotypes away about Catholics not knowing the Bible. So it's good to now be here with Ben as him as a director, and again, it's great to be with you here tonight. I just want to say one note of uh, logistics. I'm logis- I am technologically challenged. So you notice that there isn't a big screen in front of me right now. In other words, I didn't do a PowerPoint presentation. They distract me. I don't like to learn that way. So what I did do was give you a handout of all of the quotes that I'll be going through tonight. Now, I may not hit all of these, but they are there for your consumption. Um, You can reference them as we're going through them. I did assume that most of you brought your Bibles, so at times I put the Bible citations with the actual text itself. Other times I just put the Bible citations. So, let's begin in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May my heart be open and my prayer be always come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, my light, my life, my love, my strength. Be with me now and always, in all my doubts, anxieties, and trials. Come, Holy Spirit. In hours of loneliness, weariness, and grief, come, Holy Spirit. In failure, in loss, and in disappointment, come, Holy Spirit. When others fail me, when I fail myself, Come, Holy Spirit. When I am ill, unable to work, depressed, come, Holy Spirit. Now and forever and in all things, come, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thus far in the summer series on the sacraments in Scripture, we've been meditating on the sacraments of initiation. That is, the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of Eucharist, and now this evening the sacrament of confirmation. In the weeks that follow, we'll continue, as you know, to go through the rest of the sacraments. What we are essentially talking about with any of the sacraments is the grace of God. How does God give it? What is it like? How do we respond? In short, how are we a part of this great mystery of what we call the sacramental economy, the akoinonia, the Greek word, the plan of salvation, and this, the sacramental plan of salvation. Another way of saying is, this is God's plan of showering us with His abundant mercy. Now before jumping right into the Sacrament of Confirmation, I want to begin in the first half of my talk by reflecting reflecting on some of my own experiences with this amazing grace of the sacraments, which I hope will then in turn lead us to a deeper reflection of the Sacrament of Confirmation, which I will speak about in the second half of my talk. In other words, I want to share with you some of my own story of how through God's grace, He led me to His grace the sacraments of the church. I can't help but to begin this way because there was a time not so long ago that I had never even heard of the word sacraments. In fact, if you can imagine it, I have never I never heard at the time the word Eucharist. It was those words were completely foreign to me. I had heard of confirmation, but I had no idea what it was. It seemed to me that these new words and these new concepts were completely extra-biblical ideas of the Catholic Church. They did not have any rooting or foundation in the Scriptures, so I thought. So when I teach 
on something like the sacraments of confirmation, it's unavoidable for me to recall the great amazement, with great amazement, that the last time I was preparing for confirmation, it wasn't to teach on it, but it was actually to be confirmed. Which is what happened seven years ago, as Ben said, on April 27th, 2003, which was Divine Mercy Sunday, I was received into the Catholic Church by the Archbishop. And believe me, it was a divine mercy that I was confirmed Catholic. And so because God's graces are a never, never stale academic specimen, it seems fitting for me to tell you a bit more about my own journey into the sacraments that led in part to that beautiful evening in the spring of 2003. Now, before we continue, I want, to, I want to ask you all a question. By show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of the man C.S. Lewis? Okay, almost all hands have gone up. That's no surprise. C.S. Lewis is one of the brightest and most influential Christian minds of the modern world. I even mean since the Enlightenment. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you have heard of a man named Frank Sheed? Okay, some of you, but far fewer hands. The reason I bring this up is because Frank Sheed is, in my opinion, the Catholic version of C.S. Lewis. That's high praise. I read him only a little bit before I read him only a little bit before I came into the church, and I've read him a little bit more since coming into the church. But I want, want to recommend him to you as one of the finest Catholic Christian minds in modernity, much like C.S. Lewis is and was. Frank Sheed helped me to see something entirely new. The reality and the divine logic of the sacramental life that Jesus inaugurated. I might add something that was profoundly anticipated in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, and then then enacted in the life of the church for the past 2,000 years. This is something we'll talk about a little bit later. But Frank Sheed wrote a book called Theology for Beginners. I love the title. Right? How many of you feel like you're a beginning theologian? I do. I have a master's in theology, and I feel very much like a beginner in theology. And in his book, he has a chapter called The Supernatural Life. And in it, he does a very wise thing. He quotes St. Paul, the Apostle. And he's quoting from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which you may remember is affectionately known by most of us as the love chapter in Scripture. Remember how it goes, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not self-seeking, it is not rude, and so on. These These words are famous for a reason. And it's because they accurately describe the nature and the attributes of what love really is. And our world is desperate, is it not, for what authentic love really is. However, this is not the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that Frank Sheed points us to in his book, Theology for Beginners. He actually points to it to later in the chapter where St. Paul says this, quote, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Let me read that again. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. A more simplified translation would be simply this. We shall know as we are known. Well, what is St. Paul talking about here? He's talking about our capacity to know God in this life and what it will be like for us to know Him in the next life. And on this passage, Frank Sheet says this, that it's a mysterious phrase, more dark than light, but soliciting our own minds powerfully. We are not to know God with the same knowledge with which He knows us. For he knows infinitely, and we are incurably finite. But with a similar knowledge and kind to his, we will know him, different from our present way of knowing. And so when St. Paul says that we shall know God as we are known by him, there is at least hope ignited in us an immense amount of wonder, awe, 
and desire. Even if for the time being it is dimly lit, as St. Paul says in that passage. Why? It's because we will see Him. Notice how in that passage St. Paul equates seeing with knowing. To see is to know, according to St. Paul. And this is exactly how our human minds work. Let me give you an example. When someone says to me the name of my wife, Amberly, there is instantly in my mind an image created of her that springs up spontaneously and instantly. I can immediately envision her in her mind, but I don't just see her physical appearance as a sort of mental portrait. No, I see her. I see her personality, her qualities, her character, her concerns, her cares. In a sense, her physical appearance, in my mind's eye, is a sort of sacrament of her whole person. Body and soul. The two are not separated, but they are one. Body and soul. Now let me ask you another question. How many of you have ever seen the movie Avatar? No, don't be afraid to raise your hand. There's a certain amount of shame, perhaps, for some to see Avatar. I told, I, I told one of our old instructors, Mike Morris, that I went to see the movie Avatar, and he, he, he thought that I had just made an insult against my masculinity. And, but the, it's a very interesting movie in, in a lot of respects. It's a very stupid movie in other respects as well. But there's a, there's a part where the Na'vi, they greet each other with the, the phrase or the statement, I see you. Do you remember that part? And that what they mean by that is not that there you are, or behold, there you are, but I see you, much in the same way that I describe knowing my wife. I don't just see her as if she's just a physical presence, though she is. I see inside of her to a certain degree. She is a sort of sacrament. Her body is a sort of sacrament to her soul. Now that, that's something that we can easily do when we conjure up the name of somebody close to us or even an object. This is the way our mind knows. But in this life, when someone says to us the word or the name God, what comes to our mind? Jesus, that's true, but is there an image attached, let's say, to God the Father? Not really, right? We might associate the Father to our own fathers or somehow. But really when we say the word or the name God, His image doesn't spring to our mind. Because why? We don't know what He looks like. We know what Jesus looks like, since one of you said Jesus, and we'll talk more about Jesus in a moment. But we can't yet know God like we want to know Him because we can't see Him yet. We can't imagine knowing Him as He knows us, which is what this makes this verse of St. Paul so inspired. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139. And I love it because it tells me how great God knows me. It tells me how great God loves me and how great, greatly concerned God is for the very smallest details of my life, including when I sit down and when I arise. And in Psalm 31, or 139, the psalmist says this, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my, my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, you know it completely. You beset me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. You see, our minds can't even attain the knowledge that God has for us, let alone our minds attaining the knowledge that we will have of Him. If this is how God knows us, imagine knowing God in a comparable way when we see Him face to face. This is what the human heart longs for. To know God in this intimate way, whether we know it or not. To know and to be known by God intimately is what our deepest longing in life is. But we also long to understand with absolute clarity the reality of this profound oneness that He invites us to. Frank Sheed puts it this way. 
Seeing is the, is the key to life in heaven. Seeing is the key to life in heaven. In heaven, our seeing will be direct. We shall see him not through a mirror. We shall know him not by means of an idea that we have of him. Our intellect will be in direct contact with God. Nothing will come between it and God. Not even an idea. This is why the very essence of the life of heaven is called the beatific vision. Which means the scene that causes bliss. Notice the emphasis again on sight and seeing. St. John in his epistle echoes the same reality when he says, We shall see him as he is. Is this not a sublime truth to ponder? In fact, it is so awesome that words can't really express it well enough. And yet, we are given just enough light by God to, gl- to glean a small glimpse of what it might be like. Because truly, seeing is the key to life in heaven. And if I might add, seeing is also the key to life on earth. And this brings me back now to the sacraments. What does seeing and knowing have to do with the sacraments? It's because when we participate in the sacramental mysteries, we must see on two levels, or two dimensions. We have to see with our eyes, that is the material dimension, and we must see with our faith, which is the spiritual dimension. And both the spiritual and the material are part of the sacraments, are they not? The problem is that we cannot really see what is going on. We do not perceive with our natural vision the reality of what is happening as we participate in the sacramental life. We cannot perceive the reality of God and His imminent and constant presence with us. Even though we participate in the sacraments, We really cannot see the grace that is occurring then and there. It's invisible to us. We see water poured. We see oil spread. We see bread and wine elevated. We see, again as St. Paul says, only in a dimly lit mirror and with the eyes of faith. The reality of actually what is actually occurring. Because this is the challenge in our own understanding of the sacraments. In our own understanding of the reality and the power, I should say, of the sacraments. Not to mention telling others about this profound reality of grace. We want ourselves and we want others to know, those close to us, the reality of God and His love for us. I remember a story right when I was actually preparing for my own baptism. I think it's actually a very twisted story, but I think it's also very instructional. So it's illuminative. And the story is about a father and a son. And the father was desperate for his son to know the reality of God. He wanted his son to know with certainty the reality of God and his son's need for God. So he took his son out on a boat, and he began to talk to his son about the reality of God, and what that actually means for our life, that it means everything, that we can't approach anything except through the reality of God, because he is, and he in fact holds our own existence in his hands. We are alive this moment, because God is holding us in, his, in, in, his, in our existence in his hand. So the father is trying to explain this to his son, but he recognized that his son wasn't really getting it. So what he did was he took his son by the shirt collar, and he thrust him over the boat, and he dumped him under the water, and he held him there. He held him under the water to the point where his son was struggling profoundly for air, very near the point of death. And right at the moment when the the son's body began to become limp, the father yanked him back out of the water into the boat and allowed his son to recover in in the bottom of the boat. After a few minutes of the son gasping for air, 
with a look of absolute fear on his face, of confusion. Why did my father do this? His father said to him, Son, God is as real to you as your need for air. As your body needs air, your soul needs God. Do you understand? Now that's where the story ended for me. I never heard the response of the son. I don't know if he actually got it or not. I imagine he was more concerned and shocked that his own father had nearly drowned him rather than comprehending his father's theological point. That's why I think the story's twisted. You, you, we identify with the father's desire for a son to know God. But for the father to distort the image of father at per se, father qua father, by attempting to drown him, that is a troublesome picture. But nevertheless, I like the story, and I hope that it's not true, because we can identify again with this father's earnest wish for his son to teach his son that God really is, that he exists, and that changes everything. The problem is that he did so in a way, again, that distorts the image of the father. Now, I like the story also because in many ways it reminds us of the sacraments, and specifically the sacrament of baptism. The story shares a few elements with baptism. There's an immersion in the water, and there is a death, or at least in the story, a near death. And that's exactly what baptism is. As St. Paul says to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Now I study this passage of St. Paul in Romans chapter 6 for a long time before I actually was baptized. I was baptized when I was 24 years old in the Arkansas River by my old youth pastor, Fritz Dayer. And after reflecting on Romans chapter 6, and right before my baptism, I asked Fritz, Fritz, will you hold me under the water for a while? So that I can identify with what St. Paul is trying to say here, that we are truly dying in our own baptism. And Fritz, my pastor, looked at me with a strange look, but he was a youth pastor, so he was a little crazy. And he said, sure. So we are in the river, the eddy of the river, and he baptized me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he dumped me in the water, and he held me down in the water. To me, it didn't seem like very long. I didn't struggle for air. But he pulled me back up, and everyone later said, Wow, why did Fritz hold you down there for so long? And I said, I don't know. What was that all about? That was really good. <laughs> You know, it's funny, because only a few years ago, I found out that this is an ancient tradition of the church. That in the early days of the church, this is how they actually baptized people. I learned this from my pastor now, Father Ed, my senior Ed Buell. They would dunk them in the water and hold them down there. I baptize you in the name of the Father. Hold them down there. Raise them up. I baptize you in the name of the Son. Plunge them into the water. Okay? Why? So that we can be identified with the death of Christ in order so that we can identify with His resurrection, the new life, the newness of life, as St. Paul says. Now, at the time, I did not believe that my baptism, my baptism would actually save me. I did it because it was more of an act of obedience, a sort of gesture of good Christian form, rather than a compulsory act of salvation. I, like most Protestants, objected to the notion that baptism is necessary for salvation. This is true for two primary reasons, according to Protestants. First, because baptism is thought to be a work of man, not a work of God. And that we are saved not by works, but only through faith, faith alone, sola fide. Then the baptism itself is a work of man. And so it's not necessary for salvation. I think it's at least a consistent teaching on their part because of their own thinking and doctrine of justification, which is, again, as I mentioned, sola fide. We're saved by faith alone. So no action of man 
No action of man, including baptism, can save us. It is not necessary for salvation. So there is no requirement for one to be dunked, dipped, or otherwise sprinkled with water. But we can do it in sort of good Christian form. Why? Well, Jesus did it, so maybe I should as well. The second reason Protestants Protestants normally object to the Catholic understanding of of baptism is because it it seems to be a thing of magic. You dip the person in the water, you say the word, bam, you're saved. Right? It's magical. And this is what the Catholics teach about all the sacraments. You know, there's the matter and the form and you say the right words and you do the right thing and all of a sudden God's grace is there. How silly does that sound? This whole idea of efficacious, the sacraments are efficacious. To this, to a Protestant, this is scandalous. Now, Catholics and Protestants agree that salvation requires us to be buried and then with Christ and subsequently raised with Christ, as St. Paul talks about in that passage. The major difference, though, is that Catholics and Protestants disagree on the fruit of baptism. Or rather, I should say, how the fruit is manifested. Catholics, of course, we believe that these things really happen. Protestants believe that they are simply a symbol of these things that have happened already once someone receives Jesus into their heart as Lord and Savior. Now, the turning point for me came years after my baptism when I started taking a closer look at this passage from Romans 6 and also other passages in the New Testament regarding baptism. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Remember what he said in the uh, the Gospel of Mark. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now I began to notice how seriously the Catholic Church takes the words of Christ. They take them literally. Which is the way Jesus said them. Literally. This is already evidenced by St. Peter, the first pope, when he taught about baptism. In Acts chapter 2, this homily at Pentecost... St. Peter said, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul, too, was unequivocal about this in the passage we just read in Romans, also in Galatians and other passages. The words of Christ and the teaching of the church answer the question whether baptism is required for salvation and they address the question if baptism is efficacious. For me, as a Protestant at that time, the bigger question was whether something actually occurred during the baptism. That is the question of if if they're efficacious. Does baptism or confirmation or the granddaddy of them all, the Eucharist. Does this really happen at the moment that the Catholic Church says that it does? Remember what Ben said a few weeks ago about ex opere operato, by the work works, right? Objectively speaking, no matter how unholy or disgruntled the priest might be, is this truly the grace of God occurring in that particular moment? Indeed, the most scandalous claim the church makes about all the sacraments is exactly this question. Are they truly efficacious? Is some grand and real force of God, some movement of grace occurring there through the power of the Holy Spirit? And I knew that if I were to ever become Catholic, this question had to be resolved. Not understood, for who can understand the power and grace of God, but resolved and believed and affirmed with my own faith. If we must be born again, as Jesus affirms in John chapter 3, then something actually does occur when the water, the matter, is combined with the words, the form, to effect the washing away of sin, the identification of death, Jesus' death, and his resurrection. 
Now consider this. Jesus' words are powerful. When Jesus wants to feed the 5,000, He gives thanks and He breaks the bread, and the 5,000 are fed. When Jesus wants to heal a leper, He heals the leper. Be healed. Touches him. This is something Protestants know so well, our brothers and sisters in Christ. They believe very well in the miracles of Christ. So would not His Word, the power of His Word, affect what He says it does? Jesus' words are powerful. They set grace in motion, really, truly, and immediately. And so does invoking the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which we do when a person is baptized. This is not magic, but is the power of the Holy Spirit who hovers over these waters, or over that bread and wine, or in that oil, which affects the change. The proposition that Protestants offered, at least in my experience, and I don't mean to oversimplify their argument, or even mock it, but the proposition they offer is that the grace of God infuses the soul in a sort of organic, unidentifiable way when someone receives Jesus into their hearts. The only problem with this proposition is it doesn't occur in the New Testament. There's no, there's no language like that in the New Testament. Rather, the language of the New Testament is overwhelmingly convincing that this effective change really occurs while baptism is happening. There's a reason that in the Mass we say during the Eucharistic liturgy, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Remember that story in Matthew chapter 8? That was actually said by a Roman centurion, a Gentile, when he comes to Jesus saying, Jesus, my servant is is ill. Please come and heal him. Jesus says, I'll I'll go with you. And the Roman centurion, a man over a hundred other men, said, no, I am also a man in authority. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. You see, that Roman centurion had the faith in the power of Jesus' words. That if he just said the word, it would affect the change. The reality, the truth, and the power of Jesus' words regarding baptism, I found, were also true of what he said about himself in the Eucharist. This is, in a nutshell, what I started to see as I began to learn about the Catholic understanding of the sacraments. My vision in this regard had nothing to do with my optic nerves, or my pupils, or any other biological feature of my eye. Rather, my eyes were opened by faith in what Jesus said, as they are recorded in Scripture. And here I'm not talking about proof texting. I'm not trying to form an argument by pointing to this verse, or that verse, or this chapter, and say, you see, this is what Jesus said, or this is what Paul said, or Peter that, those, are, those are apologetic arguments, and those are useful, don't get me wrong. But when we really slow ourselves down, take the apologetic, the polemical question, the theological debate out of it, and, and for a moment, or for long times, periods of time, sit down and reflect carefully and slowly the words that Jesus said. The very things that he said. The actual meaning of his words with a keen desire to know the truth. Then I think these passages about baptism or the Eucharist, this is my body, begin to communicate their actual power. Christ was building in me new eyes for a sacramental reality. He used his word and he also used other people. I became accustomed to going going to Mass, but without receiving the Eucharist. And I began began to become ever more impatient in this regard, because I started to thirst or hunger, I should say, for the Eucharist. In Mass, I was observing all the liturgy, the kneeling, the rising, the bells, the incense, and all the other manifestations of Mass. 
And it occurred to me one day, I remember, that all of these people were here to pray, that's true, but they were also here at Mass to enjoy the presence of God, the real and true presence of God. That is truly the belief that God is really, truly present. I began to think to myself. And I said, if if that's not true, at least in the sense of the real presence of Christ, the way Catholics taught that it was, then maybe all of the accusations about the Catholic Church are true. That this is a group of people who participate in these empty ceremonies, these rituals, this is all just religious stuff. Maybe all of that is accurate. Or, if what they say is true about the real presence of Christ, if the opposite is is true, and I was ever more convinced that it was, then where else would a Christian want to be but in the power of the living God at Mass or in adoration, with people celebrating that presence? On one occasion I was at Mass and I ran into a lady that I used to work with at the time. Some of you may have heard me tell this story, the story of Sandy. Sandy was a a very incredible woman. She was a former witch. She was entrenched in satanic worship in the occult. She was um, participating in dark magic. She was uh, addicted to heavy drug use. But because of all her uh, affiliations with sort of dark spiritual things, she was accustomed to seeing things, though dark, spiritually. So one day I saw her at Mass and I said, Sandy, what are you doing here? Are you Catholic? And she said, no. You see, I was feeling a little bit insecure that I was at Mass. My journey into the Catholic Church was, for a long time, a bit hidden because I'd never heard that anybody would become Catholic. I heard that there were a lot of people that left the church. So I was a little bit ashamed. So I was surprised. Are you Catholic? I know. I knew that she had at one point in her life, before I met her, a powerful and radical conversion to Jesus. So she went from this satanic worshiper to a worshiper of Jesus Christ in a profound way. And that's when I met her. But I didn't know she was Catholic. And indeed she wasn't. So I asked her, Why are you coming to Mass? And you know what she said to me? I come to Mass because when the priest elevates the host, I see the angels descending upon the altar. And I said, Wow, that's not what I see. I see Catholics leaving early. I hear kids crying. I see people picking their nose, you know, but I don't see the angels of God descending upon the altar. You see, Sandy was able to see something that was real and true because God had given her the grace to have spiritual eyes. Now, I don't know if she was physically seeing the angels. In other words, I don't know if she was sort of like there they are or they were sort of in, inside of her. But it was true that, that she was seeing the angels of God. And her descriptions of the Mass were very similar to what St. John, the Apostle, describes in the book of Revelation about the heavenly liturgy. In fact, in the book of Revelation, which, by the way, is also called the Apocalypse, which is this unveiling, that's what it means to unveil so that one can see, God was unveiling to St. John in the heavenly vision to receive the reality of what takes place in the heavenly realm. For some, God chooses to unveil or break through the darkness of our vision so that we can see life now from that perspective, from the heavenly perspective. And in the case of St. John, so that he could share that with all of us. In other words, what we see does not limit what there is. The spiritual reality of life is equally, if not more, real than what we can visually see with our eyes, or feel with our hands, or taste with our mouth, or smell with our nose. There is so much more to see. Just like when we get to heaven and we see God as He is, then we will be known and know Him as we are known. There's a beautiful line, St. Paul, also to the Corinthians, that sums up what I'm trying to get out here. 
And then, again, I promise to speak about confirmation in a moment. But St. Paul says this, I has not seen, nor ear, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man what things God has prepared for those who love him. There is a desire innate in the human heart to know what God has prepared for us. This is what the sacraments are aimed at providing. God seeks to meet our greatest desires by giving us the sacraments. And even though in our present reality, our present vision, our ability to really see as they really are is limited, or as St. Paul said earlier, as in a mirror dimly lit, We believe because God has given us this faith to see with new eyes. This is why when we participate in the sacramental life of the church, we are truly participating, like Frank Shee said in his book, in the supernatural life of God. That is the life that he, his own life that he gives to us, the supernatural life. And that is what we call grace. And that is what the sacraments are all about. This is what I began to see as I made my journey into the church, as I started to question the Catholic understanding of the sacraments. I started to see that Christ is himself a sacrament. He is the image of the invisible God, as it says in in Colossians. Jesus manifests the invisible God to us. We see Jesus... He became a man, and he is the sacrament of God, of the Holy Blessed Trinity. And the church is the sacrament of Christ. We make present the realities and the powers of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Catechism affirms. This is sort of sacramental theology on a grander scale before we actually get ourselves down into the seven sacraments. And when we begin to see this, then all of a sudden the power of the sacraments become more epic, not not that they weren't efficacious in our lives, but we subjectively experience them in a more profound way. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just spent a good amount of time talking about seeing the sacraments, or sacramental seeing, if you want to call it that. I also spent a fair bit of time reflecting on my own theological journey regarding the sacrament of baptism and Eucharist. And you may wonder why I did that since you came here tonight to hear about the sacrament of confirmation. But the reason I did it was this. The the New Testament speaks more about baptism and Eucharist than it does about confirmation. However, the three together form an intricate bond, these so-called sacraments of initiation. In fact, the Catechism of the Catholic Church emphasizes that in part two of the Catechism, the sacraments, over and over and over again in the part about the sacraments of initiation. For example, you can read with me in your handout, paragraph 1212, The sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist lay the foundations of every Christian life. Sharing in the new divine nature, giving to men the grace of Christ, bears a certain likeness to the origin, development, and nourishment of natural life. The faithful are born anew by baptism strengthened by the sacrament of confirmation and receive in the Eucharist the food of eternal life. By means of these sacraments of Christian initiation, they thus receive in increasing measure the treasures of the divine life and advance toward the perfection of charity. 
Now one of the things I just want to say sort of parenthetically is that the Catechism is a beautiful document. It is magnificent. But oftentimes, because we look at it as a sort of teaching document, more didactic in nature, we can fail to recognize the profundity of the words. It's kind of like reading you know, Leviticus or something. You're like, okay, I'm just going to sort of breeze through that part about the guts falling out of a goat. You know, that doesn't really have any meaning to me. Well, actually it does. Jesus fulfills Levitical law. And when we read the Catechism, it is filled with the most beautiful words, the most beautiful descriptions of our beautiful faith, the Catholic faith. So make sure you always remember that as you as you are reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church, or if you'd like, you can walk through the Catechism with us in the Biblical School. We offer a two-year program. Ben, ben will give me extra points for saying that little spontaneous commercial there. <laughs> now, the way I want to proceed now about the Sacrament of Confirmation is by following the order it takes in the Catechism. In the Catechism, it talks about first the economy of the sacrament, that is, where we find it in the Old Testament, where we find it in the New Testament. Then it talks about the sign of the sacrament and its rites. And then finally, it talks about the effects of the sacrament of confirmation. So this is the order that I want to follow when I, when I go through the, the sacrament of confirmation. But remember that the unity of the sacraments of confirmation, as it says later in the catechism, they must be safeguarded. In fact, Pope Benedict recently wrote in his apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, the sacrament of love, of course that means on the Eucharist, He said, we need to ask ourselves whether in our Christian communities the close link between baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist is sufficiently recognized. So it's important that we we see these three together, which is why we ordered them together in this summer series. In fact, confirmation and baptism are sometimes called twin sacraments. This is because confirmation, you might say, builds upon baptism. Or as the Catechism says, it must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. So we talked a little bit about baptism, how we are identified with Christ as crucifixion and his resurrection. We then become sons and daughters of the Father through baptism. Incredible graces that we receive in this pouring of water, the saying of the Trinitarian name. But the sacrament of confirmation completes or finishes off the baptismal grace that we receive when we're baptized. In fact, the church has always debated when the sacrament of confirmation should be administered because of its close link to baptism. The churches of the East the Eastern Orthodox Church and also the Eastern Rites of the Catholic Church confirm normally infants right after they've been baptized sometimes referred to as a double sacrament which occurs in one celebration you can read about this in paragraph 1290 later on if you want to and in the East they call it chrismation you've heard that word chrismation it's the same word or same thing as what we call confirmation The Western Church has elected to separate the two sacraments largely for pastoral reasons and Episcopal reasons actually because we've maintained that it's important for the bishop to be the one to confirm which is that he is the ordinary minister of the the sacrament. It is impossible of course for the bishop to be going all over the place at the various times when babies are born and baptized. Whereas in the East they've said the bishop has, in in a sense, conferred his power to confirm to the local priests. And so it's usually in the East the priest will baptize and then confirm. And then also sometimes in the East they gave the little baby infants uh, first communion right there in, in that sacrament at the same time. There's a priest by the name of Paul Father Hafner who highlights another interesting connection between the two sacraments of baptism and confirmation. The connection between baptism and confirmation can be seen as analogous to the relationship between Easter and Pentecost. The sending of the Holy Spirit at baptism puts a seal on the Paschal mystery 
In just this way, confirmation puts the seal on the baptized person. This is in a book called The Sacramental Mystery. So, Pentecost finishes the giving of the Holy Spirit. Remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus, at the end of the Gospel, breathes on the apostles and they receive the Holy Spirit. But then later, the book of Acts, we have Pentecost, where the, there's sort of an official giving of the Holy Spirit. So, in John, it's a sort of anticipation of an official giving of the Holy Spirit, which births the church into existence at the time of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now, turning to Scripture, what do you think, what passage do you think in the New Testament is tied to the, to the confirmation of the Holy Spirit? What do you think? What? Pentecost? Did I someone say Pentecost? No? Oh, you guys are on it. Right. Normally we refer, normally it's thought of as, you know, Pentecost usually is that passage in Scripture, the New Testament, where we relate to confirmation. And that, that is true. That is an important aspect in terms of how we teach confirmation to point people to that particular passage. And we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But the, the Holy Spirit was given to Jesus in a sort of official way, you might say, when? At his baptism. Remember that John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And as he's baptized, what happens? The Spirit, the dove, descends from heaven. So this is the fundamental event that foreshadows confirmation. In the, in the New Testament. And I'd actually like to turn there with you now. So turn your Bibles, if you brought them, to Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John, that is John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now we get this incredible story of this dove that comes from the heavens and descends upon Jesus. Now where in the Old Testament do we have a story about a dove? Noah, exactly. Remember Noah's ark. And they're on the ark and 40 days and 40 nights pass. And Noah sends out the dove. And on one occasion the dove comes back with what? What? An olive branch or an olive leaf. And the olive branch signified something very important to Noah. It signified the end of the flood, number one, the receding of the waters of the flood. But it also signified the end of the judgment that God was inflicting or, uh, yeah, inflicting the world because of their sinfulness. So the the image of the the olive branch was for Noah great news that the judgment was coming to an end. And in fact, in a certain sense, a new creation was to come about after the, the waters of the flood fully receded. This itself foreshadows the new creation that Jesus wrought within the context of the new covenant. Now also note that the presence of the olive branch that the dove brought to Noah connects to the use of oil in confirmation. Specifically, olive oil. It is here that Jesus is anointed as the long-awaited Messiah of the people of Israel. In the, in the New Test, or excuse me, in the Old Testament, the anointing of one's head signified a very special mission that they were to be entrusted with. 
For example, this plays itself out in three ways. And in a sense, this will be a little bit of review because this also is what you would have covered or what we have covered already with the sacrament of baptism. But again, we have twin sacraments here. So to be anointed with oil in the Old Testament was particularly important for priests. In fact, in the book of Exodus... In chapter 40, amongst other places in Exodus, we have a commandment that God gives to Moses to anoint Aaron, his brother, and the sons of Aaron with oil in order to consecrate them. That means that he, he was to anoint them to set them aside, set them apart. For what? For a special role, a unique mission. So if you look at Exodus chapter 40, beginning in verse 12, we read this. God is speaking here to Moses and he says then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put upon Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest you shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father that they may serve me as priests and their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Now, they were anointed for a special role. But, but what is that role? It's the role of the priesthood. But what is unique about the role of the priesthood? Or what is the role of the priesthood? Sir, yes, in one capacity. But maybe even more fundamentally, to draw people closer to God by offering sacrifices. And obviously it's much more complicated than that. But in essence, a priest is to draw others to God by offering sacrifices. So the priests were anointed. Who else was anointed in the context of the Old Testament? Prophets. In the prophet Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, we have an incredible passage in chapter 61 where the prophet Isaiah announces that he had been anointed by the Lord to proclaim the message of good tidings. It's in chapter 61, verse 1. I'll read it to you now. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, says Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. When we hear this word good tidings, we should instantly think, although it's something we don't think because the language is slightly different, but the, the, the language there in Hebrew is connected to the Greek word evangelion, which is, as you know, um, the, the good news. That is, the gospel. Evangelion means gospel, or good news. So Isaiah, the prophet, is anointed with oil to proclaim good news. What kind of good news, right? That the Broncos want. <laughs> you know, no. The, the good news is something that has to do with healing broken hearts. Proclaiming liberty to captives. To help the afflicted. All these are roles of the prophet. But what is the fundamental role of the prophet? It's to tell the truth. It is to announce God's kingdom. To proclaim the word of God. Fundamentally, a prophet is a truth bearer. One who tells the truth about things. We can be prophets by telling the truth to people. Especially the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, lastly, we have, we have priests, prophets, and what? Kings, right? Kings also were anointed with oil. David, for example was anointed by the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 16. Remember the story. It's such a great story in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. 
Beginning in verse 11. Remember, God sends Samuel to Jesse's house. Jesse is David's father. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. Remember, before this, Samuel had gone to all of the elder brothers of David. Because Jesse had gone, or excuse me, Samuel had gone to Jesse's house with oil. Because God had told him, you will anoint a, a, a new king. And so he comes to Jesse's house, he sees all these brothers. And they're all strong, and they're all handsome. And, Je- and Samuel looks on him like, surely this is the one, Lord, that will become the king of Israel. But as they go through the family, brother by brother by brother, God says to Samuel, no, this is not the one. And finally, Samuel asks in verse 11, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. Right? He's the pipsqueak brother who has to go take care of the stupid sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. And Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Imagine what his brothers would have felt. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So, priest anointed, prophet anointed, king anointed. Not just David, all of the kings of Israel were anointed, usually by a prophet. Now, what is the role of a king? Fundamentally, it is to serve his people, specifically the poor. Not to mention he is to fight for his people, to lay down his life for the people, to govern with strength and power and compassion, right? This is the biblical notion of being a king. This is what it means to be royal by serving the poor. Now, all of these roles of priest, prophet, and king were wrapped up in one word or one person for the Jews. Does anybody know that word or that title? Messiah. Messiah. Literally, that word Messiah means anointed one. That is, the one who will be anointed with oil. He is the awaited Messiah. He is to be the king of Israel, the prophet and the priest. Now, the Greek word for Messiah, Messiah is a, a Mashiach, is a Hebrew word. Greek, the Greek word is Christus, Christ. Jesu Greek Christus. Jesus the Christ. It's not his last name. It means Messiah, the, the anointed one. So our Lord Jesus Christ is, the, is anointed as, as the Messiah when the Holy Spirit descends upon him after his baptism. So, in, so he's truly confirmed after his baptism. Now, we are Christians, are we not? We are little Christians. That is, we are little anointed ones. And that is what is affected by the sacrament of confirmation. In fact, Pope Benedict recently reflected on this. And he, he did the Mass of the, of the Chrism Oil, which happens on Holy Thursday and Holy Week. And this past year, he's reflecting on this. And he said, The word Christians, in fact, by which Christ's disciples were known in the earliest days of Gentile Christianity, is derived from the word Christ. The Greek translation of the word Messiah, which means anointed one. To be a Christian is to come from Christ, to belong to Christ, to the anointed one of God, to whom God granted kingship and priesthood. It means belonging to him whom God himself anointed. Not with material oil. Notice there was no oil mentioned in the story when Jesus is anointed at his baptism but with the one whom the oil represents, with his Holy Spirit. Olive oil is thus a very 
in a very particular way a symbol of the total calm penetration of the man Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Now we could go on and on about the Old Testament typological references to this oil or this anointing. There are many other places that we can go. But I want to move now to the second movement, if you will, in terms of how to teach about confirmation, at least according to the Catechism. And it's having to do with the sign of confirmation and the rites of confirmation. Now, remember, one of the things you learned in the first week, or you've known for a long time, is that every sacrament has matter and form. And in essence, if we think about it, there are four matters combined with one form. What are the four matters? Water, oil, bread, and wine. Four things. Four, mind you, is the number for the earth. We have the four seasons. We have the four winds, the the four directions, the four corners of the earth, right? So the number four is always symbolic of humanity. All of the, are not necessarily only humanity, also things of the earth. So that is where we get water, oil, bread, and wine. And the form is what? The words. The words spoken. Now Pope Benedict, again in his homily at the Chrism Mass, reflected on, on these four features or elements or matters. He said, at the center of the church's worship is the notion of sacrament. This means that it is not primarily we who act... But God comes first to meet us through his action. He looks upon us and he leads us to himself. Another striking feature is this. God touches us through material things, through gifts of creation that he takes up into his service, making them instruments of the encounter between us and himself. There are four elements in creation on which the world of sacraments is built. Water, bread, wine, and olive oil. So he he reflects on this, but then he goes on to reflect more deeply on the fourth element he names there, that is the element of olive oil. The meaning of olive oil. It's obviously a fitting homily to give at the chrism mass. So he says this, water, as the basic element and fundamental condition of all life, is the essential sign of the act in which, through baptism, we become Christians and are born to new life. While water is the vital element everywhere, and thus represents the shared access of all people to rebirth as Christians, the other three elements belong to the culture of the Mediterranean region. In other words, he says, they point toward the concrete historical environment in which Christianity emerged. God acted in a clearly defined place on the earth. He truly made history with men. On the one hand, these three elements are gifts of creation, and on the other, they also indicate the locality of the history of God with us. They are a synthesis between creation and history. Gifts of God that always connect us to those parts of the world where God chose to act with us in historical time, where he chose to become one of us. Now, we have this sort of reflection in another way in, in, the, in the creed, right? Where we say in the creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate, right? This is an important aspect to the creed because it tells us that Jesus, the God-man, the incarnate Lord, suffered in a particular time under a particular man in a particular place. Why is that such a big deal? Well, because God is eternal. God is outside of time and space. So how profound is it that God becomes a man, and as Pope Benedict reflects upon here, he becomes a man in this little tiny country in the Mediterranean. And these elements that we have, that we use for the sacraments, are Mediterranean elements, if you will. Not that there's not oil and bread and wine in other places of the world. 
But there is a certain particular flavor of Mediterraneanness, if you will, with these other elements. The incarnation was God entering time and space. The sacraments perpetuate God's entrance into time and space so that we who live now 2,000 years later are still participating, communing, living in the presence of a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He is as equally present to us now as those men and women of the first century in, by way of sacrament. In addition to the importance of oil that we already discussed, there, there is more to its meaning. This is, a, this is I'm borrowing a little bit again from the Pope's homily, but one of the things that we can think about in terms of the oil, the, the matter, is that first of all, it's a sign of God's mercy. How is oil the sign of God's mercy? This is so by comparing the Greek word, eleion, and the, and, which, was, which is the Greek word for oil, excuse me, and the Greek word for mercy, elios. Etymologically, they're comparable. So there is, an, at least in the language, etymologically, there is a connection between oil and mercy. And I think this really resonates with the special role played by priests, by prophets, and by kings, who are all at least supposed to be agents of peace, or, excuse me, agents of mercy to God's people. Now secondly, oil is a sign of peace. I misspoke there a moment. So oil is a sign of God's mercy. Secondly, oil is a sign of God's peace. How so? Remember the dove that brought the olive leaf or the olive branch to Noah. The olive branch was a sign at the end of the age of judgment for Noah. That age was relatively short. The same is true with Jesus who now takes the judgment we deserve upon his own shoulders. Now, the only way I think we can sort of get our minds around this is to consider Jesus suffering in the Mediterranean country of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of you have been there. Gethsemane literally means olive press. So Jesus is in the Garden of the Olive Press. Now, when did he go to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Right after he instituted the Eucharist, he and his apostles crossed the valley and they go into the Garden of Gethsemane. And 2,000 years ago, the Garden of Gethsemane was full of olive trees. And to this very day, the Garden of Gethsemane is full of olive trees. They're amazing trees, in fact. I, I don't, I've never seen one until I was in the Holy Land a few years ago. They're, they can be extremely wide, and they're, they're complicated, and the branches kind of in, intertwine. And they can live for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when you go there, you almost wonder, when you look at these olive trees, I wonder if that olive tree was there 2,000 years ago. It probably wasn't, <laughs> because I don't think they, they lived that long. But nevertheless, your imagination is captured by looking at the olive tree as if it's a sacrament or a sign of the presence of Jesus in that place and in that time 2,000 years ago. And of course, Jesus went there to begin his passion, his suffering for us. Now, an olive press is a very interesting mechanical thing 2,000 years ago. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a couple components, but it's a huge rock, essentially. And when you, when you press an olive to, to extract its oil, first you have to crush the olive. And they do this by rolling this huge stone over the olives. And then you have to press it. So you crush it, and then you press it. And then from this, the, the oil slowly begins to be extracted from, from the olive itself. Now, I think this is incredibly powerful 
to consider the pressure of the crushing that Jesus was enduring for us when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, remember what we learned from the Gospels. What happens to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He, he sweats blood. There's a biological name for that. I don't remember what it is, but you can sweat blood if you are, sh- if you are stressed out to the, to the max. If the pressure is so intense upon you. Now why would the Son of God have this incredible pressure, stress? He's God, right? God doesn't feel stress. Well, God also became a man. And he experienced the, the, the things that we do as men and women. And his stress was so intense and so much greater than any of the stress that we could possibly imagine. Why? Because he was taking on to his own shoulders all of our sufferings for us in a very real way. So he is crushed and he is, he is pressed. But at the same time, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is sustained by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Passion of the Christ, the movie that Mel Gibson did, I, I had never thought, I, I actually thought that was a very incredible movie for many reasons. But his depiction of Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane was a, a new idea, a new thought, a new meditation for me. I'd never thought of that, Satan being present with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But when I thought about it, because you know the scriptures don't talk about that. We don't, we don't hear from the scriptures that Satan was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But if you think about it, this is the moment in time and place, the moment of moments. This is the most important thing that is about to occur in all of human history. This moment when Jesus enters his passion. And who is the greatest enemy of the work of God? Satan. So I, I, I agree with, with the translation, if you will, of the movie, or the inside of the movie, that Satan was present there. But I also believe that the Spirit of God was there sustaining Jesus, giving Him the, the power to resist the temptation. Again, the Holy Spirit in the, in a sacrament of confirmation is the sign for the Holy Spirit. So in the Garden of the Olive Press, Jesus is there being crushed and pressed and yet sustained by that oil, if you will, of God. Now, the other thing Pope Benedict points out in his homily that's very interesting is that in the early church, after a Christian would die, they would often decorate their tombs with olive branches. Why would they do that? They would do that to symbolize the peace. Remember we've had oil is a sign of God's mercy, oil is a sign of God's peace. So to lay an olive branch on the, you know, where you are buried is a sign that you are now received fully God's peace if you are in Christ. It's a very beautiful tradition, I think. Now the third symbolic aspect of oil is battle. Oil is a sign of peace. Oil is a sign of mercy. Oil is a sign of battle. Uh, This at first seems to be a bit contradictory to the notion that oil is also a sign of peace, right? Because there's nothing peaceful about battle. But what we we must remember is that as Christians, we, we fight. We are fighters. We fight as Jesus fought, though. Not with weapons, but with love. Now that sounds so 60s hippie. I, I, I fear saying this, right? We just got to fight with, with love, man. No, it's not that way at all. When Jesus fights with love, and when we fight with love, 
we are doing something that is radical and more profound than any sword or any gun or any cannon or any missile or any nuclear weapon or anything like that. In Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, St. Paul says this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you heard the, the statement, kill, kill him with kindness? Right? The way Christians fight is, is by our love. When we, when we see our enemy, and we do have enemies. Sometimes our enemies are our brothers and sisters in Christ, in fact. Not, not true enemies, but, but sort of enemies now. Disagreements, different ways of looking at things. Sometimes our enemies, we think, are our spouses or our children. Perhaps our co-workers or our friends or, or our neighbors. Or, you know, we have all sorts of enemies. Now, not all of our enemies want to kill us, thanks be to God. Some of our enemies just disagree with us. So they're sort of a, a temporary enemy, if you will. So when you see your enemy hungry, feed him. When you see him thirsty, Give him drink. This is how we fight the battle. And if you do so, Sensei Paul, you will keep burning coals upon his head. So oil represents mercy, it represents peace, and it represents battle. And oil has for centuries been used for battle in many ways, as well as it's been used for mercy and for peace. And in fact, it's also been used for athletics. This is something that is not only true of the ancient world, but it also is true now. In the 5th century, there was a man named Faustus, who was the abbot of Larins in France. And he later became the bishop of Reims in southern France. And in one of his homilies, he reflected on battle or the military aspect of oil in confirmation. He says this, Military proceedings require that when a commander receives a man into the number of his soldiers, he should not only put his mark upon him, but also equip him with the arms suitable for fighting. So the Holy Spirit, who descended upon the baptismal waters, bearing salvation, gave all that the font gave all the font all that is needed for innocence. The confirmation he gives an increase of grace. For in this world those who survive through the different stages of life must walk among amongst danger and invisible enemies. In baptism we are born again to life. After baptism we are confirmed for battle. Now, this is an incredible quote, I think, because what, for, for a variety of reasons. But one reason is because he talks about a commander marking his soldiers. The, a soldier would receive a mark to say who he belonged to or who he was fighting for. And this is one of the fundamental features of not only baptism but also confirmation. It's called the seal of confirmation. The Catechism actually speaks about it in paragraph 1295. <clears throat> By this anointing, the confirmed received the mark of the seal of the Holy Spirit. A seal is a symbol of a person, a sign of a personal authority or ownership of an object. Hence, soldiers were marked with their leader's seal and slaves with their masters. A seal authenticates a juridical act or document and occasionally makes it secret. So it talks about sort of the historicity of seals and its use in battle and with slavery and things of that nature. But this, in the celebration of, of the sacrament of confirmation, we receive a seal. But, you know, the, the, the sacrament of confirmation is a very simple sacrament. The first thing the bishop does is he lays his hand on the one being confirmed. There's a laying on of hands. This is actually a part of the matter or the deed of the sacrament rather than the form. 
And this relates to a story in, in Acts, the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 8, when Peter and John go down to Samaria, of all places. The Samarians, Samaritans were, were enemies of Israel, of, of the Jews. And they go down there after their baptism to lay hands on them so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. So the bishop will lay hands, as he, and as he lays hands, he prays for the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he traces with his thumb, with oil, on the forehead of the, the person being confirmed, the sign of the cross. And he says this, Acipe signaculum doni spiritu sancti. Or in English, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a mark that isn't new to Christianity. In fact, there's a mark in the Old Testament that is spoken of in the prophet Ezekiel. Remember, Ezekiel was a prophet who was prophesying right before the destruction of the first temple, the temple that Solomon built. And he was prophesying to warn them that judgment was coming because of their sinfulness. And so in these visions that Ezekiel was receiving, he was, he was told in Ezekiel 9 to place a mark on the foreheads of those in the city that lamented the sin that was happening there. And it was those that received this mark that were to receive salvation. That is, they were to be saved from the pending judgment. Now what's very interesting is in the book of Revelation, St. John also is receiving visions. And what is he prophesying about? He's prophesying about the coming judgment and the destruction of Jerusalem in the second temple, which happened in the year 66 through 70 AD, culminating in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And in Revelation chapter 7, we find a reference of marking on the forehead a seal. In seven, chapter 7, verse 3 and 4, we read this. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. So those who were to escape judgment in the context of Revelation in Jerusalem were also sealed. This is an indelible mark that is given to us in our confirmation. When I say indelible, or when the the catechism says indelible, that means it cannot be erased, no matter what we do. Even if we were to reject God utterly, that mark would not be erased. Because it is the, the indelible mark. Now what is that mark? Apparently, God sees it. Remember the mark in Exodus, in the Passover, the people would have marked the, the, the top of their doors, the mantles of their doors, so that the angel of death who came through Egypt in the last plague, the plague of the firstborn, when he saw the mark on their doors, he would pass over them so that they would not receive this judgment. Same thing in Ezekiel. They were marked. Same thing in Revelation. The mark. But what is the mark? The cow. Right? The sphragus is, is the, another word for it. Well, we don't really know. Other than that, it's the mark that God sees. It's an invisible mark. But if we were to guess, and I don't think I'm taking too great a theological step here, I think it's the mark of the Holy Spirit. That God sees Himself in us. When it's time for judgment. Now that doesn't mean that we can't lose our salvation even after we're confirmed. Ben mentioned earlier that a lot of times unfortunately people are confirmed and then that's their point when they reach the church. How how wrong and, and tragic is that? Now, this mark affects enormous things. It has incredible meaning for our lives. And the Catechism enumerates them and goes through them in paragraph 1303 it says the confirmation brings an increase in the deepening of baptismal grace it roots us more deeply in the divine filiation which makes us cry out Abba Father it unites us more firmly to Christ 
It increases the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. It renders us, renders our bond with the church more perfect. It gives us special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ. To confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. And then it goes to, to explain those more. So there are many fruits, if you will, or effects of, that confirmation has on us. Remember, it's something we can't see except with the eyes of faith. But nevertheless, it's real. It's efficacious. So, when I was confirmed, when I was 29 years old, on April 27, 2003, at the cathedral downtown, I approached the archbishop, and I was, I was told to memorize a line. And I was to say this, this is all part of the rites. And I had to memorize this, although they also gave me a little cheat sheet in case I forgot. But to memorize this or to know this or even to say this was for me a profound movement, moment of grace for me. Because I had left something that I loved. I loved being a Protestant Christian. I loved my brothers and sisters, my family, all the people that raised me in the faith, that gave me a love for Christ and His Word. They are, in many ways, superior Christians than a lot of Catholics because of their love for the Word and for Christ and the power that the Holy Spirit gives to them, even if they're not a part of the sacramental life. So I approached the Archbishop and I said something that, in a sense separated me from all of those loved ones. I said, I believe and profess all that the Catholic Church believes, teaches, and proclaims to have been revealed by God. I believe and profess all that the Catholic Church believes, teaches, and proclaims to have been revealed by God. Simple sentence. But a significant sentence. Not just for me as a convert. We are all converts. All of us. Even if you were raised Catholic. Life is a process of conversion. And so when you were confirmed, you probably said the same thing. Maybe you don't even remember that. Maybe it's something that you can recite to yourself to strengthen that commitment you made. Maybe you didn't even... Believe it when you said it. But it's a mark, a moment of absolute and utter and glorious change in our lives. To come into the fold of the beautiful Church of Christ, the the Catholic Church. To be confirmed is a movement of grace. And oftentimes in this moment we are given new names. In the Bible, names are given oftentimes to people when their role or their mission is to be changed. For example, Simon was given the name Peter because he was to be the rock of the church. And my name was David. My confirmation name is David. King David. And so in a certain sense, I identify with the mission and the person of David. I pray to David that he prays for me. What does your confirmation mean? Do you ask for it? Right? All of this is a part of the beautiful sacrament of confirmation. When we are strengthened from on high, when we are clothed with the Holy Spirit... There's so much more that we're not even getting to. It's a beautiful sacrament. And the grace that we receive at our sacrament of confirmation is one that continues to this day. But we have to sort of ignite it again. Fan the flame. And allow the Spirit of God to move us, to strengthen us in our mission that is now identified with Christ. Christ's mission was to serve, to love, to give to die and that is now our mission that is what happens when we die with him in baptism raised with him in resurrection and in particular with the sacrament of confirmation we are now united with him in a way where we identify totally with that mission 
our vocation, our vocare in Latin, is to love and serve and profess the faith that Jesus gave to us. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.